with the baby. <laughs> Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today we continue with day three of Cheek Week, where New York Times bestselling author Robert Cheek interviews an elite plant-based athlete. And today we actually have an Olympic gold medal winner who is featured in Robert's book. And to, to introduce her today, please welcome back Robert Cheek. Thank you, Chef AJ. It is fantastic to be here yet again. And thank you for commenting off air about the uh, colored shirts. I'm going to run out of apparel soon. I have to go shopping with this entire Cheek Week. But I am super pumped to, about today's show because I have an Olympic gold medalist here. And I am so excited to talk to Megan Duhamel, who's an Olympic gold medal winning figure skater and world champion multiple times over and Canadian national champion many times over. And we're going to talk about all of that today and a longtime plant-based athlete. So Megan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And I was just saying off air, I apologize for any noises that might be happening in my house. I have a seven week old baby, two dogs. Um, so you never know what's going to come out and about it's hard to control. Hey, that's no problem at all. I've got a barking dog upstairs right now. I think I have a package delivery at the door, but it's, it's all good. So you are... You are featured in here, the plant-based athlete, which I'm super grateful for. And actually, as Chef AJ said, of this entire week, which she called Cheek Week, <laughs> that's her name for it, uh, you're the only one from this book uh, that we have during this week. So I'm really honored to have you on the show. And you're also the only one that I've never met in person. This is our first time meeting. <laughs> yeah, I do like kind of creep you sometimes on Instagram. So like I knew what you looked like and everything, but uh yeah, I've never actually met you, and I, I don't venture down to the U.S. all that often lately, so I haven't, uh, haven't met a lot of uh, new faces in the vegan world there. Yeah, and we did our interview for the book uh, through email. I interviewed uh, 60 world-class plant-based athletes. 30 of them made it into the book with stories, and, and including yours, which was great. And you know, I, I was thinking when I knew you'd be on the show, I was, I was thinking of dating myself a little bit here because... <laughs> I didn't actually follow your career. I was a bit earlier in, in figure skating. And then, you know, in my twenties and thirties, I was doing my vegan bodybuilding thing, but I was following during the era of like Oksana Bayul and, and a little bit on the tail end of Brian Boitano and Brian Orser. And, and that was kind of like the era of figure skating that, that I was uh, following and um, a big fan of the sport in the Olympics, of course. But I'd like to start... I think Chef AJ's audience really likes to hear the history of how this all started. You are kind of, you epitomize that Olympic dream of something you visualized, like literally when you were six years old, uh, yeah. becoming an Olympic athlete. And in a sport you started when you were, I think, three years old. I mean, this is the Olympic dream. Um, I think you even left home early at a, at a young age to pursue this. Can you, can you take us back to how this dream started? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my, I'm from a really small town in Northern Ontario where everybody learns to skate. Uh, most people will go and venture into hockey or figure skating. My mom registered my sister and I in figure skating lessons with the goal really of watching us skate in like the end of the year recital. We used to call them skating shows. Um, the dance world calls them recitals. And my mom just wanted to see us in cute little costumes doing a recital. Um, and I had an older sister that skated and like a typical younger sibling, I just wanted to follow her around everywhere. So the more my sister progressed in the sport of skating, the more I wanted to progress and be better and be as good as her and my sister's friends. Um, I must have seen the Olympics in 1992 or 1994 on TV. I don't recall that early um, watching it on TV, but I do recall telling people around six or seven years old that I was going to go to the Olympics. Um, at one point, my mom actually told me to stop telling people that because I think she thought it sounds a little silly for a child to proclaim this to people in this super small town. Um, but I just, I had this innate feeling inside of me, this goal, this drive that I knew that that's what I was going to do. And when I was 14, I told my parents I needed to move away from my small town to get better coaching and better like elite training environment. And of course, my parents told me, no, you're 14 years old, you're not moving away. Um, and I begged and pleaded until they said yes. So when I was 14, I moved three hours away from my home, I boarded with families. 
so I could skate with other Olympic and world level athletes. And I proceeded to tell everybody I knew that one day I was going to go to the Olympics and it didn't matter how many bumps and obstacles I faced along the way. I had my eyes on that prize of going to the Olympics. And that's just what I had no doubt I was going to do. No matter how bad things got, I knew that one day I was going to get there. That's, that's incredible. And it's so, uh, it's so cool for me even to talk to you because I've been such a big fan of the Olympics. And I think so many people are, it's just the, it's the biggest sports spectacle that, that comes around, you know, every four years, or I guess alternating, you know, maybe every two years with the winter and, and, and summer. And it's just, it, it's to be at the top in the entire world that what you do just must be such an amazing feeling. So can you, can you sum it up just like, I don't know, in an expression or what does it feel like to be an Olympian? And, and not only that, an, an Olympic medalist, an Olympic gold medalist, what does that feel like? I'm just going to pick up my baby so that she's, she's probably going to fall asleep as I speak. <laughs> um, so that I don't want to have an eruption of cries. This is my seven week old little Mia. Hi, Mia future plant-based athlete herself, along with my two-year-old. I don't know if she wants this. Um, you know, when I had set that mission to go to the Olympics and to go to the world championships and to be this great athlete, I never set the goal to win. I just wanted to be there. I wanted to participate. And the further I got down the road on my athletic career, the further I got in my competitive nature and realized like, if I'm doing this, I'm doing this to be the best and training as an athlete training as a figure skater was my full-time job since I was 14 years old. And it came above anything else. And a lot of people ask me, you know, you had to sacrifice so much. What did you have to sacrifice? And I always answer them. I didn't sacrifice anything because this is what I wanted to do. I didn't want to go to parties when I was 15. I wanted to train extra hours so that one day I could go to the Olympics and be the best that I could be. Um, but I, I think I can say now, having reached the, like the pinnacle of my career, I guess I was a bit of an overachiever. I won an Olympic gold, silver and bronze medal. I won two world titles. That's never what I really set out to do. So I like to think that I like overachieved my own ambitions in that regard. Well, it's all about priorities, right? You know, you, you said that you'd rather train than party and all that kind of stuff. And, mm -hmm. and I, I had the same mentality, although I never made it anywhere near the level that you made it to in sports, but I, I had that same drive. And I think that's why I had such an appreciation for athletes who made it to the very top. I could kind of live vicariously through them as I'm sure so many of us do. And mm -hmm. I just, I'm just fascinated by the fact that you did achieve this, this lifelong and childhood dream and even go above and beyond what you aspired to because so few of us get a chance to do that. And I just think that's, that's really incredible. And I've just kind of wondered what, what that's like, like what an mm. Olympic medal even feels like to, to touch. I want to just tell <laughs> it's you- heavy. It's very oh. heavy. <laughs> oh, um, sorry, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say, I was going to tell you one quick story. We were introduced through Dotsie, Dotsie Bausch, an Olympic silver mm -hmm. medalist in track cycling. I interviewed her. She's the very first person I ever, ever interviewed for my book at her house. And I really wanted to like ask her if I could like just see her Olympic medal and touch it. But I, but I, but I didn't have the confidence to do that. I didn't think it was appropriate. I just didn't do it. Oh. So I, someday I would love to just see and hold an Olympic medal just to well I can show you one through a screen if you'd like I you won't be able to hold it but I can bring them over here and, and hold that them up a, is that okay that's, that's yeah they're, they're just right over here I'll go grab okay. them that's that's amazing so for everyone uh, Megan Duhamel is one of the incredible athletes in the plant-based athlete uh, page 136 which is where my bookmark is Right there, uh, I actually had the incredible privilege of interviewing about a dozen Olympic athletes, uh, uh, including a few uh, gold medalists and world champions. And it was just one of the great honors of writing this book because when I had the vision for it, it was to tell the compelling stories of the world's greatest plant-based athletes. And we have one of them on the show today. So Megan- so This is my back. first Olympic medal. It's the silver medal from Sochi. That's awesome. uh, in 2014. It's a little bit tarnished. I don't know if it comes across for, for viewers on the screen. You can see some little chips and tarnishes there. <laughs> it's visited a lot of schools, especially like in the year after the Olympics when we did a lot of visits. Um, they're nice and thick. You can kind of see yeah, it's the so siding awesome. here. Um, on one side, they have the Olympic rings. And on the other side, it says which event I won it in. Um, 
it's hard to see like with the light. I'm trying to like put it in the best spot. It says Sochi and then around the side, team event figure skating. So that was in 2014. And then I went to the Olympics again in 2018 and won a gold medal in the team event at the Olympics. So this was Pyeongchang's medals. It's now my face. Uh, <laughs> this is the gold medal on one side. And on the other side, it says Pyeongchang along with the team figure skating event. And again, they're all equally as heavy as each other. And then three days after I won that gold medal, I competed in one more event and won the bronze medal. And this is actually my favorite medal of all, not because I mean, I think it looks cool because it kind of looks like wood um, a little bit, but this was my own individual event. The other two medals were one in a team event with a lot of great skaters. Um, but this bronze medal in my own event was the one I dreamt about and worked for all those years. The team event is a new, like really fun event at the Olympics, but the, the medal that means the most to me is definitely the bronze. That's, that's so cool. And, and thank you for taking the time to share those. Like that's that's, that's such a special thing. And um, for many of us, I'm sure that it's our first time seeing a medal <laughs> up close like that. That, that that's, that's eluded so many of us who pursued sports and hope to go beyond high school <laughs> or, or beyond college sports, you know, and, and make it somewhere. Well, you know, one fun story about um, when I was in Pyeongchang and I won this gold and bronze medal um, is that I made it to the end of my sporting career. And I think we've all heard the quote at some point in your life to enjoy the journey. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. Um, and when I made it to the ultimate end of my destination, being on the Olympic podium, all I was thinking about while I got these medals was my journey, was the journey to get there. And I'm so grateful that my journey to get there was so pleasant and filled with a lot of great people and great memories because what a shame it would have been to stand on that Olympic podium and think about my journey and having had a miserable journey. Um, so I always make sure to reiterate to people to really enjoy what you're doing because when you get to the end, what you're going to think about is the journey that it took to get there. Well, that's what I love about your perspective, Megan, where you said, it, you know, it's not a sacrifice. Like people say, oh, you but sacrificed a lot. You put in all these hours. You just worked hard. You woke up early, you were, you know, you stayed late, you practiced when you could have been socializing or doing other things, but it's like, that is the journey. You know, that, that's what separates Olympians from, from non-Olympians. Like that's what makes Olympic athletes, world athletes really stand out. So I want to talk about your plant-based diet. I'm going to read something from page 136. It's, it's okay. She I'm, should I'm, be sleeping. We just had a nice feed, diaper change. I was hoping she would go to sleep, but hey, it's a, this is real world. And I'm going to yeah, ask you about that. I might transition. just stand up as I talk to you because sometimes standing makes her feel better. Yeah, that's okay. And we're going to talk about that transition from being in you know, the top of the world in your sport to being a, a new mother of, of two young children. So on um, page 136 in the plant-based athlete, Megan, you wrote, uh, and I quote, when I became vegan in 2008, I almost immediately noticed an improvement in my ability to recover. After that, I spent 10 years at the elite level of Olympic sport and never once had an injury. I credit a lot of that to my diet, which allowed me to take care of my, take care of my body on every level. I really like that in our, in our communication with one another, you talked about how diet, at least from your perspective, from your experience firsthand, played a role in recovery and reduced inflammation. And in that quote you provided, it in perhaps played a role in preventing injuries where you went a full decade without injuries and you feel like uh, diet played a significant role in that. And you also quoted, you've been vegan since 2008. So can you talk about why, <laughs> why plant-based? Uh, you were leading up to the Olympic trials in 2010, um, which was another kind of bump in the road for you. Mm -hmm. why plant-based why vegan well you know it was really like a whim decision I had never even heard about people that were vegan um I remember coming across a skater once that didn't have dairy when I was a teenager and I was like why wouldn't you drink milk like we, everybody drinks milk why wouldn't you um but in 2008 and you know this isn't like the most educated reason for me to go vegan but this is the truth of why I went vegan um I was walking through an airport and I saw a book on the shelf and it was called skinny bitch um, and it's a super small book. I picked it up. I kind of glanced at it. I was leaving the airport and I was like, oh, I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to get it. So I brought it home. I read it all in one night. It's not a very long book, a couple hundred pages. And, uh, when I woke up the next morning, I was like, I'm going to try to quit, quit 
Diet Coke and go vegan all at the same time. Um, and I'll tell you, quitting Diet Coke was a lot harder to do on the whim than to go vegan. <laughs> um, yeah, you think so too. Yeah, she thinks so too. Uh, <laughs> so I woke up the next morning, I cleaned out my fridge and I was like, I'm going to try this. I want to be healthier. I want to be in better shape. I don't want to put this garbage into my body anymore. Um, and it took a couple more years to get the Diet Coke out, but I went vegan that moment I cleaned out my fridge I had a black coffee and I didn't like it and I was like okay I have to find some alternative to put in my coffee um and you know it was started there I intended to do it just until the Olympics in 2010 so that was my original that was my original um yeah I know I know you don't like that story that was my original reason um and then the Olympics came in 2010 I wasn't there but I was feeling really great. My body was in great shape. And I was like, well, I'm going to give it a go for another couple of years. And I never, I never looked back from a plant-based diet. I just got more into it. How could I be healthier? Studied holistic nutrition, wanted to take care of my body. And like you said, one of the things that happened was I started to notice my rate of recovery was extremely fast, especially compared to my, my training partners and my, my own skating partner who did the same training as me, but didn't eat the same as me. And he didn't recover at the same rate I did. And uh, I just found it remarkable that that was happening to my body, as well as all those overuse type of injuries that I used to experience um, years prior, they kind of went away and I, I never experienced it. So to compete at the elitist level of sport, like the elitist level, doing some of the craziest things and to not be injured is pretty remarkable. Yeah. I mean, you were, you were innovative in your figure skating too, where I, th I think you were the first, you and your partner were the first to land, uh, you know, particular, particular moves in figure skating, like in the history of the sport. Isn't that right? At the Olympics. Yeah, we were the first team at the Olympics to do the throw quad sow cow. Um, there had been teams that had done it before us in other events, but never at the Olympics. Yeah, you're you're a trailblazer. <laughs> Megan, uh, that I, I appreciate you sharing that background about your plant based diet. Uh, but what we're, I'm really curious about, and I'm sure viewers are as well, is how is it received by like the community of Olympic athletes, maybe your national team or in international competitions, was it something that you talked about or was it something you, it was just maybe a quiet part of your lifestyle? Uh, how did that go? I mean, I talked to the skaters around me. Um, I remember when I became vegan, the next, like that day I decided I went to the rink and I told my coach, oh, I'm, I'm not going to have animal products anymore. I'm going to be vegan. And he was like, oh, you're going to be skinny and sick. That's what he told me. I was going to be skinny and sick and pale. And um, his reaction like that just made me want to do it even more and be successful because I was like, why would I be skinny and pale and sick? And he was like, every vegan is. And I was like, do you know any vegans? Um, and I don't think he did. I think he was just making like a stereotypical, oh, oh, a stereotypical judgment. Um, but when he responded like that, I was like, I want to do this even more because I'm going to prove you wrong. Um, a lot of my skating friends were very interested and they always liked the food that I was making or bringing with me to events. Um, but often was just proclaimed like, oh, it's too hard to do that. It's too hard. And in 2008, it was very different than 2022. Um, you know, I, I traveled to a lot of places that did. I did have a hard time finding food and eating well um, in remote areas of China and Japan and Korea and um some places like in the middle of nowhere in Canada, but um, now it's such a different world. We can find um, plant-based alternatives anywhere we go really. But um, my friends and skating colleagues were very interested in what I was doing. I had a hard time at events, at skating events, we're given like a cafeteria where we can eat. So our meals are provided to us and um, you just go, it's like buffet style and it's catered in a hotel. And uh, so many times I talked to the organizing committee of international events, which is the international skating union and said, you should really have a nutritionist like designing what you're giving people because like bacon and eggs and fruit loops every morning being offered that for breakfast was a little bit ridiculous. No whole grains, hardly any vegetables. Um, I actually have a funny story about the Olympics in Sochi. When I went there, there was like no plant-based um, alternatives. So what I ended up doing, they had soft tofu for salad. So in the morning I would mash up the soft tofu kind of to a yogurty texture and have granola with it because I, I was trying to like make do with what I had there in the athletes village in 2018, I came with a whole suitcase of food and uh, made most of the things myself in my room. 
But uh, it wasn't always easy, the catered food that we had. And I spent a lot of my own money and time going out when I was in different cities and finding food. But that also made it fun because I got to visit a lot of plant-based restaurants all over the world. And that was really, really exciting. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And I've heard that from a number of elite athletes that I interviewed for the, this book, the plant-based athlete, uh, world champions, world-class athletes that they travel to you know, remote parts of the world to compete in all these different countries uh, on almost every continent, um, aside from Antarctica, of course, mm -hmm. well, except uh, Fiona Oaks set a marathon record there. But uh, aside from that, yeah, I hear that, that sometimes you've got to I don't know, uh, get a little bit creative uh, to find, you know, adequate plant-based nutrition in certain countries, but that it's actually, you know, it's, it's also easier than you might think. And that it's, you know, almost anywhere you go has fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, grains, seeds, produce, farmers markets, street markets, exactly. you, you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, grocery stores everywhere. So, um, well, you know, happy cow became my best friend everywhere yeah. I went. I just searched whatever city I was in, in whatever country, into Happy Cow, and I could always find something. Yeah, and by the way, for anyone listening, Happy Cow at the moment, just in the United States alone, has 2,200 all-vegan restaurants and 30,000 vegan-friendly restaurants just in the United States. And the United States is not even close to being mm -hmm. one of the most vegan-friendly countries uh, in, in the world. And, um, you know, I, I was in Chiang Mai, Thailand a while back and I, I used Happy Cow and I, and I looked up vegan friendly restaurants and there were about 100 of them within walking distance. And sure enough, I looked up and yeah, every sign said vegan, vegetarian. Yeah. And that's and that's true throughout um, places in Indonesia and Thailand. And there's even an entire German town that's essentially vegan. Uh, I've heard and, about it. You yeah. know what's very vegan friendly, though, now is Germany. Yeah, exactly. Like Germany and Italy are extremely vegan friendly with vegan options on almost every menu of every restaurant I've been to when I've been visiting. Yeah, and Austria as well. I mean, I know this may not be Chef AJ's core audience here who, <laughs> who'd be interested, but they even have an all vegan Burger King, you know, um, like 100% vegan Burger King location or multiple locations in Austria. So yeah, the, the global, the opportunity to, to travel internationally, either for you as an athlete, for me as a speaker, I've been to five continents now and 35 wow. countries. It's been, you know, it's just been so amazing. And to do it as a, as a vegan and explore all the vegan food, whether it's in Jamaica or in, you know, in Germany or, or Belgium or wherever we end up being, um, it's, amazing. It's, it's, it is, it is. Uh, I find that be, like when I would go out in search of my little vegan restaurants or cafes or grocery stores that I found on Happy Cow, it would lead me to new areas of the city that I generally wouldn't have gone to and wouldn't have visited. So that's kind of how I sightseed as well. Um, I, I sightseed and saw and learned about the place I was living in from which vegan restaurant I was at that day. Exactly. My wife and I do the exact same thing. And now <laughs> I do that with bookstores. I go and sign books in bookstores. I've been to 175 bookstores throughout uh, the United States, and I go to places I never would have seen before. At yeah. Towns, cities, parts of the town I, I never yeah. would have gone to, but now I now I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to I want to go back. Uh, well, a couple things. One, I think you contributed the sweet potato brownie recipe that I made in Chef AJ's kitchen last year when I released the book. We made a video oh. at her house, and that was your recipe. I, I'm, I'm almost it's almost good, good. Eh? I've had a lot of people. Taste yeah. it. They're like, there's sweet potatoes in here. What? Uh, hidden vegetables. <laughs> yeah. And that was cool because that's like Chef AJ's favorite food. And I was in her kitchen. I drove hours, you know, like four hours round trip to be out there to film. She was so gracious. I mean, really, I just want to take a moment. This, this book made the New York Times bestseller list and became the number one international bestseller in Canada. Uh, and because of wonderful people like you, Megan, who are in it, and I could tell your stories, but also because of people like Chef AJ who gave me a platform, she put me on her show two or three times just to talk about this book, including make your recipe and talk about the wonderful, amazing plant-based athletes in here. So I say with confidence, we wouldn't be, you know, I say we as collective, my co-author, our, you know, our publishing team, the athletes like you involved, we wouldn't have made it to a New York Times bestseller, number one international bestseller and translated into seven languages without Chef AJ. So I just have to, uh, I have to put that out there. Um, I would do a round of applause if I had two hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, will, I will do that. I'll even do a round. Make, making do with what I have right now. <laughs> I also wanted to do a throwback comment because this is going way back. I think you and I are a little bit old school. You mm -hmm. mentioned that book, Skinny Bitch. 
that also inspired my wife to become vegan more than a decade ago. And people may not know this. That is one of the most successful vegan books of all time. Last I heard, I think Rory Friedman co-authored it. Mm-hmm. I think it sold like 3 million copies. It, it, wow. Victoria Beckham was seen holding it. And it just, it, it, it just went weeks and weeks and weeks, like maybe months. Uh, I think that's as, why it became so popular. Like some yes. celebrities were seen with it. And yes. then they have the, the skinny bitch in the kitchen, like a cookbook. Yes. And then they had one for um, pregnancies. For then, moms. They even had Skinny Bastard. I think I'm in there. Oh, really? Okay, I haven't yeah, seen that they, one yet. <laughs> they had the whole series, Skinny Bitch in the Kitch, Skinny Bitch And it was all about like just getting rid of the garbage in our diet, getting rid of the sugar, getting rid of the caffeine, getting rid of animal products, everything that, you know, wasn't serving our bodies. Yeah, and there's lots of, we talk about it all the time. There's lots of different messaging that works and resonates with people. And that book became one of the best selling of all time for promoting veganism. So, um, so thank you for that shout out of that book is because maybe a lot of people don't know about it. Yeah. Um, the vegan, like how long did you say you've been vegan for? 27 years now, 1995. So you must have seen like the evolution of plant-based foods and plant-based diets, at least yeah. in North America. Um, so much, like I'm sure when you started in the world, of plant-based foods where you live or where in the U S was so different than it is now, because even for me here in Canada, it 2008 doesn't feel like that long ago. Um, it was, but it feels like yesterday, but, uh, the products that we have now and the restaurants that are offering plant-based foods and the accessibility of plant-based alternatives is just, it's everywhere. Yeah. And, and Chef AJ just celebrated her 45th vegan anniversary just a few days ago. So another round of applause oh, for, that, for that. Uh, it's amazing. And, and we, Chef, Chef AJ and I met somewhere around 15 to 20 years ago, because I remember going to her house in LA at least 13, 14 years ago um, when I first moved there. And I had already met her before that. So like we, yeah, we've been through it. You know, we've, and I grew up in an agriculture community in Corvallis, Oregon, you know, it's kind of a, a farming community, agriculture university, and it was a different world back then. But I'm so glad there are people like you who have who have performed so well in sports on the highest level that is possible for humans to achieve, uh, at, you know, winning Olympic glory, uh, because I'm as a writer, I'm able to tell your story. I'm able to tell the story of other athletes. And this this encourages people that listen, if, if the best in the world are able to get all the protein they need, all the nutrition they need uh, and, and perform at a very high level, then the, the rest of us who just you know, are not athletes or work a regular job or, or, you know, are not training all these hours a day, you know, we can, we can get enough with plants as well. And it's just, it's just one of those logical first person examples that if, if so-and-so elite athlete can do it, it must mean that I can do it. It must Mm -hmm. mean that I can. And and if only I give it a try. And 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 it's a lot easier than you think it is, than than you think it is so much easier. And um, my husband used to say, oh, I, my husband's not um, 100% plant-based. He, he doesn't have dairy, but other than that, he's not plant-based. And um, he always tells me it's so hard. It was so hard for you when you travel. It was so hard for you when you travel. And I was like, it wasn't hard. I just needed to be organized, but you need to be organized to do anything well in your life. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, So I don't see it as being hard. I need to be organized if I'm on the road and I was traveling a lot more so a decade ago than now, but um, it's not as hard as we think it is. And I think that's a big misconception. Well, Megan, what if it were hard? Um, is it not hard to be perhaps sick or feeling sick as a result of consuming animals? Yeah. 73.6% of American adults are, are overweight. 42.5% of American adults are obese. Um, and that's not at all to body shame anybody, but that's to sound the alarm that the current American, at least Western diet is not working. And Mm -hmm. is that hard? Is it hard to, to be uncomfortable, physically uncomfortable? Is that, is it hard to have a, an increased risk of uh, mortality? Is it hard to have an increased risk of developing these debilitating diseases that, that come with a Western diet that we've been, you know, saturated with, with this sugar, oil, and salt type of, uh, uh, obsessive, uh, fast food, deep fried, high calorie, low nutrient diet we followed for years. Is that hard? I would argue probably. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's, I learned this actually from a couple other guys I hope to have on the show uh, sometime. Um, the guys that run the vegan gym, they 
I don't know where they got it, but they were saying, choose your hard, you know, yeah, that's working out, working out is hard, but also not working out and, and, you know, gaining extra weight and not being uh, as athletic Paying medical bills that are unnecessary to pay. Well, that's hard, you yeah. know, getting up early to, you know, to do your, get your training in or to meal prep or whatever is hard, but it's also hard to deal with the consequences of not doing so, you know, and just choose your hard. And so I think that's a, I don't know, it's an interesting concept to, uh, to dive into, but mm-hmm. and Megan, I'd like to go back in time, if that's okay. Uh, who were some of your childhood heroes? Oh, one of my big childhood heroes is definitely Elvis Stoiko. So that would have probably been your generation of, of knowing skating came up in Canada after Brian Norser. Um, he was a four time, three time world champion, I think multiple time Canadian champion, Olympic medalist. And one of the things as a child, I really loved about Elvis Stoiko was his mental strength, um, his ability to perform under pressure, regardless of whatever scenario he was in. Um, and I've had the the pleasure to go on tour with Elvis for many years now. And I love to pick his brain and ask him about that. And that was one of the things that I became very interested in as a young athlete was I want to be as strong mentally as Elvis Stoiko. So he was one of, one of my big idols in that regard. Um, coming up after that, Michelle Kwan and Tara Lipinski, the two American skaters in the late nineties were definitely big idols of mine. And I remember Michelle Kwan once um, in a book, I read like every skating book back then we didn't have the internet the same way we do now. Right. So I would read, I would read things on the internet and um, or not on the internet. I would read things in books. I had every book and uh, Michelle Kwan said, if you want to be the best at anything, you need to study it. You need to study whatever it is that you want to be the best at. So I was like, oh, I need to study skating. If Michelle Kwan said that, I need to do it. Yeah, I think Michelle Kwan's pretty smart, Amy. And uh, I had just decided that that's what I was going to do. I was going to study the sport to be the best that I could be at it. So, um, yeah, it was really... I, I learned a lot from them, even though I didn't meet Michelle Kwan or Tara Lipinski or Elvis Stoico as a child. I learned a lot from them from researching and reading about the sport and about their lives. You know, Megan, I think I'd like to hone in on that point for a moment, because I think what you're saying is, is, is it could be even be life changing for people if they really take it for the value that I think it is. What, what you're saying is, you, you've got to model those who have found success. You've got to look at the, look at their look at their secrets, look at their approaches, and there oftentimes is a blueprint to getting to a destination. And mental strength is a huge part of it. And I can't even imagine the the mental strength that it takes for a figure skater because you have to have precision in your movement, precision in your landing, precision in everything that you do, and and one slight you know one slight mistake or whatever could change your, your entire score. And then your, your, your Olympic dream is and there's over. There's no second chance. There's there's no second chance. They get a couple of attempts. Right. right. You cannot fall. You cannot make a misstep. You cannot miss your, your cue. Um, so I, I think the mental strength is huge. And so I think what you're saying with like Michelle Kwan is, is, is to, uh, is to model those who have already, paved this way and figured things out on their own and to learn from them and maybe even create some sort of shortcuts or something learning from their trial and error and their mistakes and apply that to yourself, which I think can be true for anything from writing to singing to art to uh, learning a craft or a skill. Yeah. Of, of, so There's I think so much to say. <laughs> She's you, just yeah. learning about her vocal cords. She's got lots of practice yelling <laughs> yeah, we'll have mia on the show in a few years <laughs> and, uh, get her, get her perspectives and see how they've changed since this first interview i do agree with you though that um if you want to be the best at something you need to look at what the people before you have done and it doesn't matter if it's in sport in writing in art um in television whatever it is you have to you have to look at what everybody else has done before you and learn from their mistakes as best as you can. Obviously, you need to make your own mistakes to learn as well. But um, learn from their mistakes, read their stories, be inspired by what they did. And there's so much to learn. She usually likes laying in this position. It's a strange position, but she loves to be here. <laughs> yeah. She's just like refusing some naps today. Yeah. Like I said at the top, I planned everything that she was going to be eating and dry diaper and sleeping, but with a baby, you can't really plan. 
<laughs> that, hey, that, that's that's okay. So I'd like to talk about what you're doing. I'll, I'll, hold you up I'll still hold you. Let's bounce. So you, 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 I guess, I don't know when you officially retired from skating. And sometimes it's hard to say when we actually, you know, retire and if we're totally retired. Um, do you, do you skate? Do you skate any, any more these days? I haven't in a while. Um, two, exactly two years ago, I did a television show in Canada, a reality show I called Battle of the Blades, where we teach NHL hockey players to figure skate. Yeah. Um, that was a great experience. It was, it was a little bit unique because we were working around COVID restrictions and COVID rules. We were doing a live TV show without an audience. Um, and in skating, the audience is extremely important. They provide us a lot of energy and, and whatnot. So um, we, I ended up winning the show. It was a really great experience. Okay, let's fly like this. It was a really great experience. Um, and since then, I've skated so little. Uh, my my partner that I competed with and had a lot of success with, we had planned on having a long and hopefully lucrative professional career touring all over the world, which we did for a couple of years. Um, but he decided after I had kids, um, I still planned to tour professionally, but um, he decided to go back to competition and go to the Olympics that just happened in Beijing. So I think my opportunities in skating and my skating days are a little bit behind me. Now I have two kids. Um, I help coach a little bit um, of skaters and, you know, finding my way as a mother and I'm raising two plant-based kids and uh, learning, learning a lot about that because I wasn't raised as a plant-based um, child. So when I started my two-year-old um, after nursing her for, for a year and started her on solids, I was learning a lot about the right foods to, to provide a baby, an infant, a toddler um, to grow properly and, you know, thrive on a plant-based diet. So that's been fun too, to learn about that. What does that look like? So what, what kind of diet do your, your, your young children have and, and your, uh, and yourself these days? And, and, and is your diet different now than when you competed? Cause I, I, I kind of ask that for every athlete because mm -hmm especially a lot of bodybuilders or powerlifters, their diet is way different. They cut the calories in half, you know, they don't, don't have to maintain as much muscle, but I don't know as much about figure skating and what your diet would have been like competition versus now. Can you kind of uh, expand on that? Well, now I'm a little bit more relaxed about the junk food that I eat um, and eating like when I can. I'm not as specific about the times I eat because I just can't be, I don't, I have to take care of my kids first. Um, but um, as a figure skater, like we're not so much like loading on calories and carbs and, and protein and whatnot. It was just a well-rounded um, whole foods plant-based diet that I focused on having. You seem the most comfortable in this position. Um, now I pretty much eat the same as my two-year-old. Every morning we have, okay. Every morning we have blueberry oatmeal and I ask my two-year-old, do you want chia seeds or hemp seeds or almond butter in your oatmeal? We go through the list. We call flax we call flax seeds brown sprinkles or the chia seeds are black sprinkles and she picks which seeds she wants almond butter or peanut butter mixed in it um so yeah she loves that she loves to start her day with her, her oatmeal with me she goes to daycare twice a week so I pack her plant-based snacks for her daycare um muffins cookies bars um the daycare provides fruits and vegetables so I don't need to worry about that um that's been a little bit of a challenge because the daycare is not a plant-based daycare. I don't know if that exists, but I can't find one around me. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll find one for you. Maybe I'll find one for you, Mia. Um, so um, the daycare, they do like a, a meal delivery. So the, they do deliver her. Oh, you're just so fussy. They deliver her a plant-based lunch with all the other kids. So like if the kids are eating a burger, she gets a plant-based burger to go with it or whatever um, so that she feels included. And for lunch, for dinner, we eat a variety of things. Um, pasta, bean-based bean pasta, lasagnas, casseroles, um, all sorts of different things. And I do a lot of baking and cooking myself as much as I can. Yeah, I think that's, it, it's kind of like anything you can do I can do vegan, you know, or anything you can do, yeah. vegan, do vegan. And so I right now I'm testing out a new recipe to make um, vegan pizza rolls. So kind of like a cinnamon roll, but it's going to be like with pizza. So I've got the dough making and the bread maker. I'll put you back in your flying Superman position. That's going to be your favorite. Oh. Okay. Oh yeah. Ooh. Mia, you're a star. What do you see? Mia, do you know that Chef AJ has 160,000 YouTube subscribers? You are a huge star right now. 
Uh, is this Mia's first video? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My two-year-old's at daycare today, but um, I've got I, the baby's attached to me because I'm nursing her on demand. So yeah, yeah. I can't can't go far. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. We'll 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 finish up pretty soon. And I appreciate your time today. Um, and I appreciate you being uh, uh, flexible and, and switching days to do this and, and all that. Um, I'd like to ask you, I'm just so fascinated by the Olympic uh, achievement uh, that, you, that you've done. Can you tell me what the most valuable lesson you've learned by being an Olympic athlete is? Oh boy, most valuable lesson. I mean, I've learned a lot of them. Um, one of the, the biggest lessons I learned is I, I mean, it's something that we hear all the time, but life is not fair. You can work and work and plan and plan, and then something can happen that feels out of your control and potentially not fair. Um, I'm gonna put her. I'm gonna put her in a little jumper and see. If she can see sure. Yeah, that's kind of a principle of sports. She like it, but she might like that right now. Um, life isn't fair and you have to adapt and go with the flow. And that sometimes can be really hard when you're an athlete and you're so set on routine and everything is structured and strategized. And then something throws you a curveball and you have to adapt and adjust. And I was not in an individual sport. I was skating with a partner. So I always had to adapt to another person. Um, so one of the big life lessons I learned from, from sport was that it's not fair and how, how crucial it is to learn to adapt and go with the flow in stressful situations, which sometimes when we're trying to control things, it's really difficult to do. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. I think that that is a powerful life lesson that sports gives to us. Sports mm -hmm. reveals that to us that, I mean, you could be a track and field star, you know, and the hundred meter sprint and, you know, you're, a, a, a fraction of a second too early and you don't get a second try and you're, and you're out, you know, mm -hmm. or, or swimming or something like that, or some other things out of your control that, uh, or it's a call from the referee or, you know, whatever yeah, or, in that regard or a, subje a subjective sport like yours, which is being judged by a panel mm -hmm. of expert judges who, you know, one little, one slight change in a score changes your future, you know, um, <laughs> Uh, One judge going by 0. 0.5, 0. 0.25. Um, change, can change everything. Could be a medal or not a medal. Could be so many things. Qualifying for the Olympics and not qualifying for the Olympics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was so great about 2015? If I understand correctly, you won, you won the gold at every international competition you competed mm -hmm. in and the world championship that year. Like you won everything <laughs> in your sport all over all over the world you're like, yeah. like undefeated <laughs> what was going on in 2015 oh man I wish I could like dial in and put my finger on it and just have repeated that uh, for three more years after that you know coming off 2014 was a little bit of a disappointing Olympics for me I won a silver medal with the team event but only finished seventh in my individual event um, I underperformed and 2014 was my first Olympics. And I had this vision going to the Olympics of having this Olympic moment, like Tara Lipinski, like all the great Olympic champions have in various sports, they have the performance of their life and they get the gold. And it's like this amazing moment. I dreamed about having my Olympic moment and I didn't have it. And it was so disappointing. I was so disappointed in myself. Um, and it, it took a while to get over that, but after a couple of months, I was able to kind of like move past that disappointment and let, let it use, let me use it as inspiration to move forward instead of disappointment. Um, and realize that, you know, I didn't have my moment that time. Why didn't I, was I too fixated on results? Um, was I too fixated on what was going on around me with my competitors, what the judges were going to do. The focus wasn't solely on me. So going into the 2015 season, my partner and I were like, we want to do things our way. We want to do what we want to do. We don't care what place we get. We don't care what score we get. We just, we wanted to learn the throw quad, which made us um, famous for the next couple of years. And we chose to skate to rock music from Muse, which isn't, you know, traditional figure skating music. And um, we were like, we're doing it our way. We're going to love it. And when we finish every competition, our goal was to be happy and to be proud. That's it. Very simple. We wanted to leave the ice happy and proud of what we did. And if we finish fifth or if we finish first, we would have been happy because we did the best we could. So we kind of streamlined our goals 
and things became so simple. We skated well at every event. We won every event we entered. Um, but then after winning the world title that year, we started the next season with different expectations. So we had a really hard time repeating the magic of the 2015 season. Um, and that's what sport is all about. It's about learning and making mistakes and, you know, doing well, making mistakes and learning as you go to be the best that you can be. And I think it also reminds us how fragile the journey is that you may not have this moment again mm. right? to like, to really appreciate it for what it is because you, you may not get it again. Mm -hmm. And did you feel like that at all when you exited uh, figure skating? It sounds like you, you thought maybe you'd go back to it. And I think I've read some of this from you, whether in an interview or I read online or even from your own social media pages that you, when you, when you started a family and you kind of alluded to it today already that you, you thought you'd go back to it. Did you have that, you know, there's that farewell moment, you know, when Michael Jordan leaves the court, you know, for the last time or, or when Tom Brady's going to walk away for, from his like fifth. Uh, I don't think he ever will. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know he's going to be 60 playing the NFL and still, and still winning, but mm -hmm. you know, so Tom Brady's not a good, a good example, but <laughs> you know, but, but the, for the elite athletes who walk away for the last time, mm -hmm. like what that's like when you leave the ice, when you leave the court, when you leave the field, did you, it sounds like maybe you didn't have that because you thought you'd be back. Maybe have a, a child yeah. come back or start a family and then come back. Or yeah. did you have that moment? Did you say, this could be it? Like, th maybe this is the end of the road for me. Well, like I did and I didn't. So um, after I retired in 2018, uh, I knew that the Olympics in 2018 was going to be my last competitive moment. And I was totally okay with that. I had achieved everything I wanted in my career. I went to the Olympics in 2018 to have that Olympic moment. I had it. I was rewarded with a bronze medal and a gold medal for it. Um, and then I toured for a year all over the world, toured in Korea, in Australia, across Canada, in Japan, a couple of shows in the U S and, um, then I had a baby, took a little bit of time off and then started getting ready to go on tour again. And that's when COVID hit and all of the, all the world shut down, but so did professional sport tours. And so um, all our tours were canceled. So during that time, I did question like, well, maybe that's it. Maybe we're never going to come back to a point where we gather thousands of people in an arena again and travel the world and go on tour. And I was okay with that. Um, I had some great experiences in my, my professional skating career. Um, and I was okay if that was going to end, but I really hoped it would. I really hoped it would come back to the world that we are now seeing um, reopening now. Um, and in the middle of like this COVID issue, I did that television show I was talking to you about, The Battle of the Blades. And I had such an amazing time skating with my partner, Wojtek, and with our choreographer, Mark. Um, Pile. He was the choreographer I worked with on the show. And that was one of the most amazing moments of my skating career was doing that television show. And I remember when that show ended, I thought to myself, if I never perform again, that was a great way to end it. Um, I wasn't sure if I would ever perform again, but I thought if I never do, then at least I, at least I had that show. Um, and then shortly after that's when my partner told me he wasn't returning to do professional tours with me, that he was going back to competitive skating, which was a really big shock to me because we had planned to tour for as long as we possibly could. But, um, you know, you have to adapt, roll with the punches. And I had to adjust my life around that, that maybe I wasn't going back on the road, decided to have a second child earlier than I originally would have. I would have never had a second child this early if I was going back on tour. And, um, uh, yeah, adjusting to things now. Now with two kids and not having a partner, I don't foresee myself going back um, professionally because I need somebody to do that with. I'm not good enough by myself. <laughs> I need somebody to throw me and lift me. <laughs> yeah, you you were part of uh, uh, pairs figure skating, um, a, a duo. Um, so you're you're fl you're flying through the air and and you're you're being lifted up and you know and and you know so soaring above the ice mm -hmm. and all of that which obviously yeah mm -hmm. it does take it does take a partner to do that and I think yeah. that's also part of sport where you earlier mentioned that you know it's not always fair where you had full expectations of going back and then that opportunity was maybe changed altered or or, mm -hmm. or taken away you know without you know that wasn't what you expected. And Absolutely. That, and and that, I had to adjust. And that's right. I do. Um, along with coaching now, I do a lot of work as an analyst with CBC Sports, um, the major television network in Canada that airs 
figure skating events and I was broadcasting during the Olympics and stuff like that. So I found a different path for myself within the sport that I love because I love the sport of figure skating. Um, and I wasn't ready to leave that behind entirely when my life kind of got thrown upside down, having my partner kind of leave my side. But um, I had to find a new path within the sport. And, and I was able to do that through coaching and broadcasting. Yeah, that's great. And it, it's being adaptable is so crucial and so important in this in this whole process. Mm. So so Megan, I, I we're going to wrap up here. Um, I'm just just a last couple questions here to to kind of bring it on home. Uh, you talked a lot about I mean, you really did live the Olympic dream from when you were three you started skating, you had the vision at age six to to be in the Olympics, you had your Olympic moment, you won a bunch of medals in every shade of gold, silver, and bronze. Uh, you, you talked a lot about your heroes. And if I recall, almost all of them were figure skaters and you know, your childhood heroes. Um, what about now? Who are your heroes and role models today? That's a good question. Um, I think as I got older, maybe not like specifically right today, but as I became an older athlete and, and a parent and whatnot, I try to find inspiration in, in various people around me. When I'm coaching, I'm inspired by the students that I'm coaching, whether they're six years old or 22 years old, how they're you know testing their limits and trying to reach their potential in the sport and working really hard. I'm inspired by my husband. He's an Olympic level coach, um, doing really great work with athletes and taking them to the height of their career. And I'm inspired by my kids. Um, my two-year-old, she's, you know, she's something else, uh, but she's super inspiring. And I, I find inspiration, you know, around me um, within the people in my community or my family and whatnot, and the people that I work with. Well, thank you for sharing. And Megan, you're one of the lucky ones. Uh, obviously, work ethic and so many other factors go in there besides luck. But I think just as to summarize, you're one of the lucky ones that got to really pursue your dream and see it fulfilled. Absolutely. What if it didn't? What if it didn't happen? What would you be doing if figure skating? I mean, 2010 was a, a time you thought maybe it was over. Uh, yeah. And you didn't go on to win all your success. Most of your success came after 2010. So what would you be doing if figure skating didn't work out? Yeah, I've questioned that a lot over the years. Every time I hit an obstacle and I was like, is this time to stop? Is this, you know, is my lofty goal of going to the Olympics too much? Am I just not capable of that? Um, and you know what? I definitely would have gone to university and I would be a school teacher. I, when I was a child, I had a vision board in my bedroom. My mom still has it in my bedroom. And there's pictures of figure skaters and Olympics. And then there's pictures of school teachers. Um, and it was always my dream. And I still, I'm 36. I still um, bring myself that maybe I do want to go back to school and, you know, live this second dream of mine, which was to be um, a kindergarten or grade one, two, three teacher, you know, really primary school. It was something I always wanted to do. And it's like the one thing in my bucket list that I have never done. I've, I'm so grateful that I have, I've checked off almost everything on my bucket list, everything except be a school teacher. Um, I did do a year and a half, almost two years of my schooling for that as a young, like when I was a, a teenager. And then the higher level I got in skating, I just couldn't commit to both the work needed for sport and the work needed to fulfill a university degree. But I've, I've brought myself back to that many times, like, why not? Why not go back and finish that degree and, and be the teacher that I always dreamed I could be when I was a child? Yeah, that's, that's great. And, there, and there's still plenty of time to do that. You know, mm. that's, that's the beauty of, I think, uh, and I can, I can kind of resonate with that because I, I just relate to it because I did the same. I had a bodybuilding career for 10 years, but I always wanted to be a writer since I was eight years old. I worked at it, worked at it, worked at it, but then bodybuilding became my passion. That's how I made a, some sort of name or reputation for myself. I was basically average. I was just one of the, the first vegan bodybuilders that anyone ever knew of, and I was mm -hmm. fairly good at marketing. And so I've been able to do a second career as well as a writer. And uh, I mean, I've written 600 pages over the last six months. I've just immersed myself into it. And, I, you know, fresh off a New York Times bestseller, it's nothing, it's nothing like winning an Olympic gold medal. But for me, it kind of, it kind of is my. It's your career. Olympic gold medal. So to speak. Yeah. I, I, I'm not equating the two. Uh, obviously, many more people make the New York Times list than win Olympic gold, I think. But, but it's, it, it was 
the highest moment that I could get was to make that list, which was something that I, I dreamed of for a long time and, mm. and was able to do that and fulfill that. And obviously you're, you're a part of that. And Chef AJ is a part of that. And so many people are a part of that and I'm grateful for it. But I think your, I think your idea uh, is, is, you know, worth exploring. I mean, uh, obviously if that, if that is still something that tugs at your heart, not that we have to follow every intuition or follow every passion. And sometimes that's not even good advice to follow a passion, mm-hmm. but um, you never know. It could be your second career and it could be in many ways, just as rewarding, just as fulfilling. I, I think so. And I, I do, when I think about what's next for me, like, what do I want to do next um, in my life? I'm always coming back to that. So you never know, maybe next time you talk to me, I'm going to be back in school. I don't know. <laughs> well, Megan, I want to thank you and Mia for being on the show today. I know it's a lot to juggle with two, two very young children. She fell asleep like an hour too late, but of course now she's sound asleep. Okay, we'll start over, scrap it all. <laughs> uh, I'm sure Chef AJ has nothing better to do and you've got nothing better to do. I've got other, let's do it again. Uh, there's so many things we didn't cover. No, uh, Megan, it was it was it was so great talking to you. Like I said, you're the only person here on Cheek Week that I haven't actually met before and never talked to, not even through video like this before. Mm-hmm. You're the only person that I'm interviewing who's featured mm-hmm. in this book. And so I have to thank you again and again for contributing um, to the book's success and, and helping me vicariously have my own Olympic gold moment with this <laughs> book. And I thank you for taking the time to come on Chef AJ show today. And I appreciate your wisdom and knowledge you shared. Uh, you're one of the, the greatest athletes um, that I know of. And, uh, and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much. And thanks for your patience dealing with a seven week old. Uh, but I think she did well. And now, now she'll take her nap now that I'm not needed to, to be logged into something. But uh, no, that was great. It was great to chat with you. And again, to also see you because I've only seen you through Instagram stalking and, and which is mostly like this, right? It's this. Yeah, lots of that. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's all that stuff. <laughs> Ridiculous. Oh, it's awesome. It's awesome. Well, I just want to thank both of you and Megan. First of all, I just want to say that Mia is the youngest guest that has ever appeared <laughs> on Chef AJ Live. So, like you, she likes to start her career early. <laughs> and I also want to say that even if you don't ever get your degree, you already are a teacher because one of the biggest takeaways for me from this show was when you said how when you were little, you just told everybody you were going to the Olympics and you didn't know how. And I have a similar story. When I was seven years old, I just wanted to be on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and I didn't have an age, and I didn't, ha- I didn't have any talent. And I just kept saying it. And when I was four, and when I was 14, and again, when I was 27, and again, when I was 35, I was on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And so that teaches people, you, as long as you have a dream, you'll find a way to fulfill it. So thank you so much. It was really interesting hearing everything you talked about. And I really enjoyed this conversation. Oh, thank you. And I love that. I love that story as well. You'll always find your path to what you want. You'll create your own path. Absolutely. I, I was brought up that if you can conceive it in your mind, you can achieve it in the world. And you, I, I mean, what an astounding uh, success story and, and congratulations on having a wonderful baby and family and who knows what's next for you or Robert. Robert, it's not too late for you to win some kind of medal, I'm sure. <laughs> they keep adding new sports to the Olympics. Maybe you'll, you'll find one that, that you'll excel at. Yeah. How about book writing number of pages in a single day? I'm pretty good at that. I, I'm very, <laughs> I'm very, very fast. The mind works quickly. I, I do want to say lastly, that I had just like you, your Johnny Carson moment, your Olympic moment. This, I, I'm being 100% serious, eight years old. I, this is when I started this. I started working toward this at eight. And I, I, all three of us have had that in common that it's just, it's going to happen. And it took me, I'm in my 40s now. I started at eight, it took me to my 40s to get there, but got there. And, and I- Things are I, worth the wait. Yeah. And it's, and like Megan, you said, it's the journey that matters, right? Even if I never got here, the journey would have been so worth it. Mm-hmm. So inspiring. Thank you both. Up, oh, she's up again. So thank you all. You just for dropped your Zoo there. I had to replace it. That's why. <laughs> Oh, she's adorable. Thanks so much, everyone, for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for the continuation of Cheek Week when Robert interviews another elite 